Hello, I'm Stuart Barker here at High Table, the ISO 27001 company. So today we're going to look at how to deploy and how to implement your ISO 27001 policies. So before we leap into that, first things first, you're going to want to create your ISO 27001 information security policies. You've got two choices. You can get yourself a copy of the standard, which you should do. Uh, anyway, you can trawl through the standard and look for any instance of the word policy and then work out what it is that you need to do to create a policy to satisfy the requirement. Or because such a, I'm such a lovely guy, uh, I'm all about you, right? I have created those information security policies for you. So I have created an ISO 27001 policy bundle that includes every single information security policy that you are going to require for ISO 27001. I've pre-populated it with what good look like, looks like and I have given you everything that you're going to need. So either create your policies or download the pack. What we're going to do today is we're going to go into a look at how we would then go about deploying those into our environment. So again, because I'm all about you, I have created you a handy guide. There is a document guide. Anytime you purchase a policy or acquire a policy from me here at High Table, you get a copy of this handy guide. Uh, if you want one, then just reach out to me and I'll send it across to you anyway. It is free. Um, but we're going to talk through that. So how to implement and how to deploy policies. Do, 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 do. So we have a policy pack. This document is designed to go alongside that policy pack uh, and it talks you through it. But again, if you have your own policies, then where it relates to policies that I have provided to you, then you can just insert your own policies. The actual process is the same. So when developing policies, obviously what you're going to do is you are going to follow a structured process, right? So you are going to create and develop your context of business. This isn't covered in this tutorial, but you need to go through all of the context documents to understand who you are before you create your policies. Okay, a bit of a caveat. So what are policies? Policies are statements of intent. They're statements of what we do. Policies are not statements about how we do it. How we do it is going to be covered in information security processes. Now, the reason that we separate out our policy from our process, our statements of what we do and how we do it, is we don't want to confuse the two. If we confuse the two and we include process steps within policies, it may be the case that we start to include confidential information, confidential steps, confidential things that we do. Often a process will include a, a name, uh, an email address, contact details for individuals. So we want to completely separate those out. Policies are documents that are going to be shared with external auditors, definitely as part of your certification, but they could be shared with clients as well um, as part of your client onboarding and your client due diligence. So that's what policies are. They're statements of what we do. They're not statements of how we do it. How we do it is recorded within a process document. So what are these policies? These policies within the pack, again, if you've purchased the pack, are what good looks like. So they're pre-written, pre-populated with what good looks like. Um, they're built around over 20 years, two decades worth of experience, hundreds of audits on both sides of the fence, conducting audits, helping clients through audits, taking audits. They're based on industry best practice and they're based on industry standards. So they're designed to fast track that build and that implement for you. So they're a starting point. They're a starting point. You're going to review each policy for what it says and make sure that that statement of what you do applies to you or could apply to you if you're on your journey. And if you cannot or will not, then you have to work to do in terms of understanding the changes. But that's what the policy pack is going to give you. So building your pack, building your policy pack, what you're going to do is you're going to create a storage area somewhere. You're going to create a storage area when you're building your policies and then you're going to use that to maintain your version control. So we would advocate creating a folder structure with subfolders underneath it for the various versions. Policies are going to be branded. Again, this relates to the pack that you buy uh, from me, but your policies have to be branded. Clearly, they're going to have to look like you. What we're going to do is we're going to assign an owner as part of our implementation and deployment, an owner for every single policy. 
Now, you can see that we have deployed a pack of policies. The reason that we have deployed our policy policies as a pack rather than one large document is for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is a way that we can communicate our policies effectively to the people that need to know them. If we have a large document that talks about cryptography and network security, when we come to share that and educate our employees on information security, are those sections really going to be relevant? Are they relevant to the person on reception or the cleaning staff? Are they going to be relevant uh, to the various departments? So what we have is an overarching information security policy that sets out the framework and the structure, includes the required elements of ISO 27001, and then we have a pack of sub-policies that cover specific areas. Areas. Now, this in ISO 27002 changes 20 in 2022. So the Annex A is changing and it actually calls that out um, and, and suggests that uh, as an approved method. So it's a great way of getting your policies. So what we want to do is we're going to assign those because that's the second reason that we would have a pack. We want to assign the policy to the person that is accountable and responsible for it and knows everything about it, right? So we're going to assign the malware and antivirus policy to the person in charge of running and managing malware and antivirus. Software development, likewise, that's going to be assigned to the person responsible for software development if we do it. Physical security assigned to the person responsible for physical security. What that does is it drives accountability and it gives us a point of contact to keep that policy up to date, especially when it comes to the review stage. It is pointless assigning a policy to somebody that doesn't know anything about the area. They're not going to be able to be reviewing it and they're not going to be held accountable for it. When we assign people to policies, we assign individuals. Again, this is just a top tip. Technically, could you assign it to a team? You could, but that won't drive accountability, right? If you assign a policy to a team, it is likely that people within that team are going to say, oh, I thought such and such was doing it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a named individual down and we're going to assign that person in the document. As part of our first pass deployment, what we're going to do is then we're going to review those policies. So you're going to go through each policy and the assigned owner is going to review that policy. If you have created it or you've taken my pack and they weren't involved in it, then you fast tracked their implementation. Then they're going to review it for two things. Firstly, does it say things that we currently do? So is it a statement of what we currently do? And if we are on a journey of improvement, then does it say things that we could do, right? A part of our journey of improvement, could we do that? If there are things in there that we don't do, can't do, and will never do, then clearly as part of the review process, we would take them out. You would work with your information security manager to understand the impact of taking that, that out. Oftentimes it may be minor, uh, but sometimes what it may require is a process of risk management. So by removing a control aspect, what we may need to do is to create a risk item and then manage that through the risk register. Again, risk management is for another tu tutorial. So you've got your policies, you've branded your policies, you've assigned them to owners, the owners have reviewed them and they're now what good looks like. So now what do you do with them? So now what you're going to do is you're going to update your version control and document markup. You can see that all of the documents that we create have document markup on them. They have the document classification, they have a document owner, last review date, they have version control, very important. This relates to a policy that we have called the document and records policy, but it is good practice. And again, it's required by the standard. So you're going to want to make sure that if you're creating your own policies, that it has those document markups and control points on it. So once we've got a stable version, what I would recommend is setting everything, all of your policies to version one, if this is your first build or annually, if you're going to do your review, set it to your next full increment. And we're going to update that document and we're going to up, update that version control. What are we going to do? What, do we, what does that mean? What that means is our policies as part of the review have to be signed off and approved. Now, there are again, there are different ways of doing it. You could have physical signature on every policy um, by the responsible person. You could have digital signature on every policy. It depends on the rigor um, and complexity of your organization. The way that I like to manage it is I like to manage it through the management review team. 
So again, on another tutorial, we'll talk about roles and responsibilities, but assume we have an oversight body. I would take those policies in their version one format ready for release to that oversight body, the management review team, and I would seek approval and sign off an agreement that those policies can now go live. Once we have that, we are going to document our management review team again as part of that process. And once we have that sign off and our documented minutes of that meeting, then we're going to update the version control of our policies to reflect that fact. What we end up with at the end of that is a version, in this instance, version one, a live version. And we update our document version control to say the date of the management review meeting that approved it and signed it off. So this is a great way of demonstrating leadership buy-in, leadership commitment, approval and sign off. So at that stage, you are good to go. What I would then be doing is I would then be taking those policies, putting them on a publicly accessible, sorry, an internally accessible uh, storage. So that could be on SharePoint. It could be on a file drive somewhere that all of the employees, contractors can gain access to them. I would then communicate to the company that those policies are live. I would direct people to read them. I would communicate to the individuals that policies apply to, that those policies are live and that, they, then that they're applicable to them. So that would be my first pass through, a communication of the policies. If this is an annual review, I would also communicate the changes that have occurred since the last set. What you are then going to want to do is you are going to want to include those policies as part of your training. Now, there are two primary policies that I would seek sign off from everybody in the organization on, and that would be the information security policy high level and the acceptable use policy. But you're going to have to work out which policies apply to which people and then seek that they understand and that they accept them. There are tools out there that can help you. A lot of the uh, information security training tools allow you to implement your own bespoke modules within it and give you that benefit of tracking signature and, and acceptance. But what have you got? You've got branded policies that look like you. You've reviewed them. You have signed them off and you have agreed them at the management review meeting. You have made them available to all internal employees. You have communicated them relevantly to the people to which they apply. You have sought their approval through whatever mechanism and you have a record now that they have accepted those policies. So that's going to be your first deployment and implementation. Let's just touch a, touch a little bit in terms of the pack. If you go with the pack that I provided, again, I, guide you, I provide you with guidance on how to complete it. So these steps are only really relevant to that pack. But the packs include things like um, light blue text, which are variables that you should look to change. There is text in brackets that you should look to replace with text that, that applies to you. The question that people are going to ask me are, which policies do I actually need? Potentially, you're going to need all of them. So these are information security policies. They do rely on other company policies. When you go for 27001 certification, clearly you're going to need any policy that is legally, legally or regulatory applicable to you from other departments. You're going to need HR policies. You're going to need grievance policies. So you are going to need other policies that are outside the scope of the ISMS, but you are going to rely on. When it comes to the ISMS, then the policies are going to be applicable to whatever it is that you do. So once you have completed your statement of applicability, statement of applicability is a list of the controls that apply to you covered in another tutorial, then they are going to drive which policies that you have. Example, if you don't do software development, either in-house or at all, then you are not going to deploy a software development policy, clearly. If you have GDPR or a data protection implementation, you're going to need clearly data protection uh, policies and a data retention policy. As part of the pack that I built, I do provide those for you, um, but there is an expectation that you have them. So policies are going to be based on who you are, context of organization and the controls that you have. But there you have it. That is a fast guide on the steps that you need to take to deploy and implement information security policies into your organization. The final question that you're going to ask is how often do I review them? You review them as significant change occurs and or at least annually. So there you go.
Thanks for joining me today. See you on another tutorial. Be sure to subscribe to my channel below. Thank you.